Traditionally, when you're practicing metta meditation, you start with people who are easy to feel metta or goodwill for, people close to your heart, people that you love. And then you start spreading that same attitude once you feel a sense of well-being with that goodwill. You start spreading that to others that are more and more difficult until you find that you can sincerely wish all people, all beings, that they find happiness, you wish goodwill for them. The same principle applies to the breath. When you're working with the breath, trying to get acquainted with the breath in the body and use the breath energies in the body, it's good to start with an area that's relatively comfortable so that you're coming from a place of well-being as you start dealing with the more difficult parts, the parts where there's tension, where there's tightness. Don't go right there. Go first to the areas that are relatively relaxed, open, at ease. And even though the ease may not be much to begin with, you can protect it. Pay careful attention to it. It's the paying careful attention that's going to make the breath comfortable. Because you get more sensitive, and as you get more sensitive, the kind of breathing that you would ordinarily put up with, you decide you don't like it anymore. You want something better. And then when it feels good staying there, then you can start moving out and working on other areas that are more tense, more tight. Think of the breath energy penetrating them. Remind yourself that the breath is actually there first. All too often we have the image of the pain as being like a wall or some solid block. We're trying to force breath through there. But you have to reflect on the fact that your sensation of the body, your awareness of the body, comes first through the breath. The breath is prior. It belongs there first and hold that sensation or that perception of breath being first. And it will help break up the sense of solidity around the pain or around the tension. That way the breath gets spread throughout the different parts of the body until you can actually be with the whole body, even though there may be a few little pains nibbling here and there. But for the most part, most of the body has a sense of being connected the energy is flowing freely so that parts of the breath, parts of the breath energy field that may be weak right now, you can think of breath energy that is healthy in another part of the body going right there. So your perception of body is all breath. This is one aspect of when they talk about singleness of preoccupation. You're on with one topic, and then that one perception fills the range of your body. Your awareness fills the body. The reason we meditate in quiet like this, where things are still, is so you can get good at this skill. But you don't want to use it only when things are quiet and when you're meditating. These are skills you can carry into the rest of your life. Today we're talking about sitting in a meeting. You don't have to be bored by the meeting. You can play with your breath energies. Then you find that even as you get involved in more and more complex activities, you can still have some sense of the breath energy in the body. It may be too much to ask you to keep track of whether the breath is coming in or going out, but just have a sense of the general field of energy and whether it feels connected, whether it feels at ease. And any parts that are not at ease, you breathe right through. This enables you to put up with situations that otherwise might be very unpleasant. You say, at least I've got a friend here. This is the key to learning patience and endurance, is that you don't focus on the bad things that are happening around you. You focus on the things that you have some control over that you can make pleasant. So it's not simply a matter of bearing up, bearing up, bearing up against something that's difficult. You've got some friends inside. And 
we say that you can bring this skill into the rest of your life, that includes the parts of life that we don't like, like aging, illness, and death. You can use the breath to help give the mind a more pleasant place to stay. As you're sick, as you find that the body is beginning to fall apart, and even as you die, of course you're going to have to leave the breath at the moment of death. But the skills you've gained in learning how to get the mind to settle down, and particularly the skills you've learned in how not to go with distractions, are going to be very important at that point. They'll be crucial to your well-being. You want to be able to die in a good mood. And a lot of that will require all the skills of meditation. So when you're facing an illness, on the one hand, you've got the breath to help you. But these other skills we have, like learning how to take apart a, a narrative that's building up in the mind. The mind has this tendency, especially when the body is healthy and everything is going well, to spin out lots of potential narratives and use them as entertainment to see how many different narratives you can create, how many different selves you could create in different worlds of your imagination. If you followed this desire, what would that be like? If you followed that desire, what would that be like? But as the body begins to shut down, you realize that that particular tendency can get you in trouble. So as we're learning how to meditate here, learning how to take thoughts apart, to deconstruct them, that's going to be a, an essential skill. So how do you take them apart? Well, one, you try to notice how they form. All too often we're with the breath and suddenly before we realize it, we're someplace else. It's as if a curtain had gone down in the mind. We suddenly find ourselves as it goes up on a new scene, like a new scene in a play. And you have to ask yourself, how did that happen? So you get back to the breath and you make up your mind, well, the next time there's any indication that the mind is going to go someplace else, you want to be alert to it. And over time you find that you actually can begin to see the, the telltale signs that the mind is getting ready to leave. It's like an inchworm at the edge of a leaf. Part of it is on the leaf, but another part is already waving around looking for the next leaf to hop onto. And as soon as the leaf comes, it's gone. The mind may be with the breath, but it's not fully there. It doesn't have all of its feet on the breath. So when you see that sign, you have to breathe in a way that's especially gratifying, that's especially arresting, to pull your attention back. And as you get closer and closer to see how these things begin, you begin to see that there's just a little stirring right at the place where the mind and the body meet. And the stirring could be interpreted either, either as a physical stirring or as a mental stirring. And you have the choice. You can treat it as a case of tension in the body, or you can treat it as a potential thought world. And we're very good at that. So what's this about? And we slap a perception, oh, this is a thought about X, and then you get into that topic and you go running with it. Well, you have the choice. As soon as that little swiggle or stirring of energy appears, breathe through it. And you'll find that you'll nip a lot of thinking in the bud. Then you get back to the breath. You haven't really left the breath, you've just directed your attention together with the breath to that spot to smooth out or to comb out the little knot that was beginning to develop there. And as you do this, part of the mind will object, and that's the part you want to catch. The part that says, I want some entertainment, I want to think about this desire, and I want to be thinking about who I am or where I'm going, what world I'm going to live in, what they call becoming, which we're doing all the time. And you have to ask yourself, why do you go for these things? This is where you bring in the teachings on inconsistency, stress, and not self. That where do these things lead? They're just more stress, more stress, more stress. You start out, it seems to be under your control, but then as the, the thought world develops, it gets out of your control. 
that's the not-self part. It's going to do things that you didn't want. And when you can't anticipate that, that helps again, nip in the bud a lot of your desire to go with the thought world. You want to bring things back to something very elemental right here, where there are very few narratives. In fact, the fewer narratives, the better. Breath, awareness, sense of the body, feeling. Let these things be as impersonal as possible, with as few narratives as possible. And they lose a lot of their, their hooks. I was talking this evening with a student who's been told by his doctors he has two or to ten months left to live. He's got cancer, and he's been trying all kinds of different treatments, and the last one didn't work. And the doctors say, well, someone in this position has about two or ten months, and they talk about all the potential treatments they want to do. But tonight I think he wanted to talk about what happens if the treatments don't work. And that's the big one right there. You've got to get things as elemental as possible in your awareness, because if you start thinking about life ending, it becomes very dramatic. Your identity is ending. That gets dramatic. But if you see, these are just elements. There's awareness. There's feeling. There's a sense of the body. There's a sense of the breath. Leave them as impersonal as possible, and it gets a lot easier to let them go when they have to go. He was commenting ironically that all of his life he had wanted to become somebody special make a name for himself, and just in the last couple months he actually did gain a little bit of fame. But I was beginning to realize that that's all meaningless right now. And as long as you can see that as meaningless, it takes a lot of the sting away. So you got things elemental. There's a woman who was a student of a John Fuhan who is meditating when I, and I've told this story before, but it bears retelling. And this voice came to her and said, you're going to die tonight. So she figured, well, if I'm going to die, I might as well die meditating. So she continued sitting there. And sure enough, the body started developing pains all over the place. And she said it was like being in a house on fire. No matter which room you went into, it was on fire. In other words, pain everywhere. Then she realized, okay, there's, there's the space element. In other words, a sense of space around the body, and then you can think of it perceive it as penetrating through the body. You can go there. So she made that the topic of her meditation. Then when she came back out of meditation, everything in the body had settled down, so she hadn't died. But she had to learn, learn an important lesson. You get things elemental like this, just space, or just knowing. Then as things begin to fall apart, your brain's not working very well anymore, and just maintain that sense of being aware, aware, aware. If you can be aware of the space, fine. If you can be aware of the breath, you can make that comfortable, that's fine. But again, keep it as impersonal as possible. Then when you go, the mind goes in a much better shape than it would have otherwise if it was trying to grab onto things. There's a famous John in Thailand who's had a student who was dying of cancer, and she came and meditated with him for three months. He gave a long series of talks, and the lesson he repeated over and over again is try to get a sense of awareness, the observer, as clear and as distinct as possible, as something separate from the pain, separate from the body. They're there together in the same space, but they're, you can say, think, think of them as being on different frequencies, different levels. And you hold that sense of awareness, and other things can pass, and it's not as affected nearly as badly as if you're trying to hang on to this or hang on to that. So keep things elemental. This is a lot of what the not-self teaching is all about. The Buddha is not saying there is no self. He's not saying there is a self. He's simply saying self is an activity. It's a type of clinging. 
And wherever there's clinging, there's going to be suffering. So you do want to do it. And while you're on the path, there are certain types of self that you want to hold on to. But when you find that holding on to them is getting in the way of finding a deeper peace, a deeper sense of well-being, you've got, you can let them go. And that way the mind is not creating problems for itself. So learn how to depersonalize things. And this is a good lesson for daily life again. When we're dealing with difficult people, the Buddha says, you know, unpleasant sounds are making contact at the ear, or leave it at that. Don't make it more personal than just that. Realizing that human speech has all kinds of qualities. It can be good, it can be bad, it can be friendly, unfriendly, true, false, well-meaning, ill-meaning. That's just the nature of human speech. So the fact that some unpleasant speech is being directed at you is not, not all that much out of the ordinary. When you can see these things as normal, then it's a lot easier to deal with them. When you learn how to see aging, illness, and death as normal, it's a lot easier to deal with them. That chant that we regularly chant about being subject to aging, illness, and death, and in Thai it's translated as aging is normal, illness is normal, death is normal. So learn how to treat them as normal things. That removes a lot of the sting. Years back we had someone else coming to visit the monastery, undergoing radiation treatments. And he told me that the doctors had given him a 80% chance of survival, and everybody was talking about the 80%, the 80%. Of course, that made him wonder about, what about the 20%? So I said, okay, here we're going to talk about the 20%. There are things you can do to prepare for death, just like you can prepare for aging and illness. So you have all these potentials here that you can actually fall back on and actually use. They're your help as you go through the difficulties of life, aging, illness, death. There is space. There is the breath. There's awareness. And if you don't complicate things by putting a lot of personal narratives in there. Your perception of things, that your sense of these things can actually be a support for you. So that when things have to leave, when you have to be parted from things, you can do it without suffering. So, okay, this is something normal too. This is what the Buddha is giving us, a range of skills so that whatever happens in life, it's normal. And the mind doesn't have to make a big deal out of it. Because the one who makes a big deal out of it is creating a huge, big mass of suffering. So these are the skills that he has to offer. And it's in our best interest to develop them as best we can. We've got the opportunity right now. We're still healthy, strong. Our brains are still working. So work on developing these skills that you'll need when things are not so going so well. And John Sawat, after he had his accident, had some brain damage. He told me he learned how to see the perceptions coming up in his mind. It's simply just as that, perceptions, and he learned how to recognize them when they were off and when they were not. And a lot of that had to do with not identifying with the perceptions, having that sense of the observer that just watches. And even though this observer is a construct, it can be very, very helpful. And John Munn's instructions to John Mahabhoy, he said, anything comes up in your meditation that you're not quite sure about, go back to the observer. Just watch it, and you'll come out safe. Well, the same principle applies to 
a lot of the other sufferings or potential sufferings in life. If you don't dramatize them, you don't make big deals out of them. But learn to watch them as normal. You'll come out safe. <laughs>